Hello and welcome to episode two of Office Freedom, the podcast Flex with Richard Smith. Joining me once again is my co-host, the CEO of Office Freedom, Richard Smith. So this episode, we're going to talk about the Flex Office industry, where it started and where perhaps it's heading. So Richard, you, you've mentioned some of the office space providers. Um, just talk to me about some of the incredible offices and the incredible buildings and, and the things, the facilities they have mm. in terms of offices. Let's talk maybe central London these days. Yeah, well, look, um, we have occupied ourselves various different flexible workspaces in central London. Um, and there's a space we were in in Soho. Um, that was which, Fora. That was Fora. Um, and I described it as office paradise because it was, it was amazing. Um, we had a nice chunk of space, private, self-contained space. Nothing shared in these spaces um, that um, that we're in, except for the communal areas. And the communal areas are really what has taken the industry to the next level. Because if you think about it, if you go into a traditional leased office building, and I've been in a thousand of them, you're probably in the office, more. probably more. You're in the office, you come out of the office, and then what do you see? The lift or the elevator. I've got to cater for my US clients here because, um, you know, I've got lots of friends across the pond. Sure. Um, and then you go down the elevator and then what happens? You leave the building. So it's the space, the elevator, the exit. Whereas in a flexible workspace, there are, there's a ton of space that is dedicated to uh, breakout space, to event space. Um, uh, the, the space we were in had a gym um, had a roof terrace, had a library, had a sleep pod. Uh, I have it, to say, when I came to see you at your offices uh, on, on numerous occasions, I'd walk into the space downstairs and there'd just be people with laptops sitting on little stools. It was very cool. It, the, it had its own culture. Yeah. Yeah, that is the look and feel of the breakout spaces whereby your staff can um, unwind themselves, they can eat, they can drink, they can um, have informal meetings with each other. Um, and they can also um, book meeting rooms on a pay-as-you-go basis. Um, so these buildings are an entire habitat of a place to enjoy working. You know, normally over the years, when you know, Gav, we've we've been in business for a long time, and let's face it, everyone just dreads going to work, don't they? Oh, I've got to go to work. Not anymore, because you go into these buildings, you can actually enjoy it. You can walk around. You can go into these areas. You it's can like collaborate. An experience, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. You can, yeah, and this whole thing is a massive link in with mental health, staff wellness. You know, it's so important nowadays, um, and we'll talk about this on the next show, but, you know, after what we've all been through, we're all going to be very scarred yeah. by this experience. So I have some friends who are in, uh, they're in some sort of flexible office space in Camden, and they're sort of designers, and everybody within their building, it's like a co-work network now. They all feed each other business. Mm. And, you know, someone needs a designer, there's a designer, go and see Jim downstairs, he's a designer. Yes. You need someone to do some coding, go to Arthur up on the top floor. Um, yeah. And, and it's, it's become, it's almost like um, a, a buzzy network. Yeah. It's a whole building full of collaboration, um, partnering, um, mentoring, nurturing, um, training facilities it's it's just a whole habitat yeah. whereby you can have um, a great platform for your business and so this isn't really just a story of real estate and property it's really the evolution of working of the working uh, situation environment because i think for me when i look at um some of the the properties that where your clients go and i i, 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 I have seen quite a few it's an environment it's an atmosphere it's like a it's like a hive of activity and you can you can walk into a place and almost get the look and feel and the vibe of what's going on and think this is absolutely for me for my business yeah these are the types of buildings where you walk in and you think oh, i could work here whereas the industry 10 15 20 years ago you walk into a lot of the buildings and you think mm, i couldn't see myself working here and that's why it's it's finally evolved but i guess the big change also is when you look at some of the development going around along around the city of london um and the west end and king's cross and then you look at traditional um businesses like lawyers accountants who i would imagine would have taken traditional leases over time and as they grow and expand and as they want to offer their staff something different then obviously flexible workspace opens up for them yeah i mean the industry now attracts all types of sectors um 
tech, finance, um, media, um, even like accountants and lawyers who were historically um, not really big fans of serviced offices. Um, so even they have been unable to resist its charms. And, you know, the amount of meeting areas that they need um, is amazing. And But quite often I've heard stories that they'll rent a traditional lease and the meeting rooms that they'll use, sometimes they'll only be used 40 or 50%. So why would you want to rent a massive chunk of space 24-7 when you can have the option of pay-as-you-go? You can mix pay-as-you-go with dedicated meeting rooms, but, um, yeah, there's no sectors now that, that, that don't consider flex. And I guess it's interesting because if we look at parallels alongside your universe, okay, so we've moved from a world where we would happily go to Woolworths and buy a, a single or an album and pay our money because you wanted ownership and now we're used to Spotify and downloading where you don't own, but actually you have access to everything. And I guess the the thing running alongside that really stems to cars, ownership and car leasing. And now we have the same really with, with offices. Yeah, it's the ability to... Um, actually, I don't even really know the answer to that question. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's just perfect. You threw me a googly You there. could just go, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, um, I, guess, I guess you're right, Gav. Yeah. Yeah. There is a there is a phrase for that actually called the gig economy, um, the sharing economy, um, and that is true for the industry, um, whereby the shared facilities are what makes the difference. Um, but again, I must keep highlighting the fact that those shared facilities are um, are in conjunction with private self-contained space. There is this myth in this sector that service offices is just a whole massive shared environment. It's not. The communal areas are shared, and it means that if you can utilise the communal uh, meeting rooms and breakout spaces and event spaces, it means that you don't need to rent that space yourself. So in other words, when you rent space in a flexible workspace, you could probably get away with renting half to, 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 to three quarters of what you would need in a lease. So when you sometimes work out the, the rent per square foot serviced office versus a traditional lease, it often looks expensive on the per square foot rate. But it's all about the total occupancy cost. What's the most amazing thing you've seen in, let's say, communal spaces in offices? Like something that you've just thought, wow, wow. Yeah. The most amazing thing that I've seen is probably um, the sleep pod, whereby you can utilise, have a nap, have a sleep, have a kip, um, and go and rejuvenate and come back to the office refreshed. I think when I saw that... Um, it reminded me of the of the Michael Jackson sleep pod. Do you remember when he used to go in there and it's like an, oxy- yeah, like an oxygen tank? Yeah. Um, you know, to have facilities like that, um, whereby you can do that, I think that really took my breath away and made me think, you know, this industry is just accommodating to what people want and what people need. It's just a change of habit, a change of focus on the customer. Um, the landlord is focusing on the customer, whereas I think the traditional landlord is completely separate from the customer. Once that uh, property is let, it's down it's to the done. customer and there's no interaction. And that's the difference. 2020 was carnage for everyone in every walk of life, in every field of business. Um, actually, not everyone. I mean, I think um, Mr. Bezos did quite well. Um, Tesla, I think, did quite well. Um, Apple did quite well. Yeah, I think $600 billion was the uh, amount that I heard that certain businesses combined improve their value. So um, it was all to do with, I don't know, working from home for Amazon especially. Um, but the reality is that the majority of, of us have, have had a tough time. Um, and yes, like in any business, there's been some issues. I mean, recently, unfortunately, um, Breather, uh, Serendipity Labs um, have gone into Chapter 11. Um, also, no uh, in the US only, but actually they've just been acquired out of Chapter 11 um, by Newmark, um, very, very large firm of um, real estate uh, specialists in the US. Um, so they will emerge from that. In fact, they never went into Chapter 11 in the UK and we do you know, a lot of business with them. So um, hopefully they will emerge out of that. Um, so yes, there, there have been, and you know, what happened with them is that Everyone's a genius in hindsight, aren't they, Gav? Of course, of course. Um, And so when you, you know, if you're overexpanded uh, at a period whereby soon after there was a big dip, 
um, you weren't to know, and obviously it's unfortunate. But I hope that they will emerge these companies that have had a problem um, into a better place. A bit like Regis did. Look, look at Regis. I mean, um, or today's IWG. Yes, they were in Chapter 11 in 2003, but now look at them. 3,300 locations, um, 110 countries, um, £3.65 billion pound va- market valuation. I mean, come on. Yeah. That's, that, 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 that's incredible. Well, let's be honest. I don't think anybody saw 2020 coming quite the way it did with COVID-19. It's a black swan event, and let's hope it's on its way out. If that's all we can look forward to right now. But it does feel like the world's getting a little bit of normality back to it now that everybody's getting vaccinations and, and other bits and pieces. Yeah, it definitely does. So I understand there's been some big news last month. What, what can you tell the viewers about that? Well, the big news is that, um, and I'm very excited about this announcement, is that um, CBRE, the world's biggest real estate services company, um has made a $200 million investment into a flexible co-working company called Industrious. Um, It gives them approximately 35% holding, which values the company between $575 and $600 million. Wow. So this is a... If people were wondering where the flex market sits in today's new world, well, wow, this is a major statement of intent. For many reasons. Firstly, CBRE are a traditional specialist in property, not flex. They are the world's biggest agents, but they're so much more than that. Um, They're an institution in themselves. Um, And going back over the years, it was very hard doing business with companies, with traditional agents and landlords, um, the likes of CBRE, Jones Lang LaSalle, Cushman, Colliers, Savills, great firms, but they didn't really embrace the serviced office concept and it was uphill work. Um, now it's, it's all changed um, and the concept has been embraced, not just by the um, agents, but also by the landlords. I mean, I'm talking British institutions like, like British land, Um, with story, like legal and general, with capsule. Um, There are so many examples of companies that have opened up their own flex brands. The Crown Estate um, have got their own flex brand. Um, So what's amazing about this deal is that CBRE have invested in a flexible workspace company and they have their own brand, actually, CBRE, called HANA, um, and now Industrious, um, and industrious have about 100 locations in about 50 US cities. Um, they are going to be taking over the the, uh, the running of the HANA properties, which would allow them to scale as well. So, and this was, you know, industrious is, a, is an interesting example because they are a company, uh, a bit like a Riga in the UK, that focus on, instead of renting the buildings themselves on traditional leases, they focus on partnering with, with the landlord of the property. Um, whether it's a partnership or a JV or a profit share, but they don't take traditional leases. So that's why Industrious in 2020, while everybody else was pruning, so to speak, they added a million square feet onto their footprint. So um, going forward, for CBRE to be investing in the flexible workspace world, I mean, wow, that says that says a lot. And they they have an incredible amount of corporate clients themselves. Um, and they know that they will all be wanting to be taking their fair share of flexible workspace instead of leases going forward. So that's a big moment for the industry. And it was a big moment for you as well, because it was your most liked LinkedIn post in your history, I noticed. <laughs> yes, I have to confess. You were um, on fire. Yeah, I have to confess, I um, haven't been an expert in LinkedIn, but that is something that drew me to to do the post. Um, yes, and it did get a, a, a lot of views. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to um, further announcements going forward because I think there's going to be a, a lot of movement. One of the questions I wanted to ask you today, which I think the viewers may be interested in listening to, is what's your motivation for doing a podcast? What What is the story you want to tell from doing this? Well... The truth is, Gavin, that any time anybody has mentioned to me a podcast or a webinar or appearing on a, you know, an event like that, I would basically run away and hide. 
because it's not it's not really my sweet spot. It's not in my comfort zone. Um, but I thought to myself, you know what? Last week, I woke up, fifty three years old, uh, on my birthday, and I thought, you know what? You've been in this for thirty thirty five years. You've seen a journey. You've seen a story. Um, you know, I take it for granted, but actually it's probably quite a, an interesting story to tell. You know, the journey of this industry that has taken it from a mum and pop industry into becoming a mainstream part of corporate real estate um, and being a viable alternative to traditional leasing of, you know, all size transactions. You know, that has been some journey. And I just thought that I would brave Brave the studio. Um, I know you were very nervous about doing this, but I have to say, I yeah. think, I think, you know, I hope the viewers agree. I think you've done a pretty solid job. So, Gavin, I mean, it's very nice of you, but you are kind. <laughs> You're normally too kind to me, so I'm never quite sure you've where, done, where it where You've it done lands. a good job, don't you worry. Um, and the, sure. o- the other thing is to say that not just my journey or the industry's journey, but also where um, where the journey, sorry, where the industry fits in with the whole pandemic is really very current and topical and yeah. I think is of great interest to everybody. One of the questions I wanted to ask you, Richard, is is there a big difference between like, flexible office space and regular office space? It's a good question. Um, they pretty much merged. There is no real difference anymore. It's serviced offices, flexible workspace. It's just office space. There's just this idea in people's heads that it's either shared or it's this thing called workspace as a service, which is a phrase. I respect the phrase because it's out there. I don't personally uh, use it because I just feel that it confuses the matter. At the end of the day, people need office space and this is private, self-contained, secure office space. And you've got your own front door and nobody walks in and it's just like you're in a normal building except for the fact that it's got all of the communal aspects as well which is what sets it apart but the actual office space that's why it's becoming a, a mainstream alternative to traditional leasing because it's it's, it's it's offices and it, and maybe a lot of it is because people thought it was all like cellular space some of it wasn't very w- well lit in the old days private rooms with just not much natural light um, but now you want to get two three four five ten fifteen thousand square feet on flexible workspace, let me know. I've got plenty. Okay, so you've said office space is office space, but then what's the flexible benefit? Well, there's many. Flexible short-term agreements, one, two, three pages, as opposed to long, onerous leases that can be a 100 pages. Um, fit out, you know, it's zero or nominal fit out to actually um, get into these spaces where on a traditional lease, it can be very expensive and time consuming. Um, Fixed pricing and nominal indexation increases in the flex world as opposed to upward only rent reviews in the lease world. Upward only rent reviews, in itself, that doesn't Mm. sound right. I mean, there's been many occasions over the the years when a client has taken space at X pounds per square foot, okay? Um, When it comes to the rent review, the ERV, the estimated rental value, the market rent, has gone down significantly. So on review, why wouldn't it be reviewed down yeah. or up? No, because in the old-fashioned institutional leases, they said upward only. It's not fair. It's not right. They don't have that in flex. It's just a fixed term or indexation increases. Reinstatement, dilapidations in a lease, very costly. Um, you've basically got to put the space back to how you found it. Yeah. E- even if you've got beautiful partitions in great in, in great condition, um, you've really got to strip it back to where it was in an open plan, redeck it and present it back to the landlord. You don't really have that expensive. in flex. Very expensive. And that's a big bill. What I call extraordinary service charges. What does that mean? Well, that means that when you're in a full repair and insuring lease, um, if the landlord were to re reclad the exterior or clean the building or put in a new lift or a replacement of the roof and let's just say that you occupy 20 percent of the building um, and the bill is a hundred thousand pounds twenty thousand pounds please well you people don't expect that they don't really realize that when they, they don't s- budget for it either. no it's not in the budget um the ability to upsize or downsize or even relocate at short notice in flex is everything 
Whereas if you take a traditional lease, you take X amount of square feet and that's it. After a period of time, if your staff levels move up, then you're basically bursting at the seams. If they move down, you're swimming in the space. That's not good. That is not agile. You need more flexibility. Um, and to be able to outsource the FM, I mean, how many times do you have to deal with the headaches of running a building? But to outsource the facilities management to the operator of the space whilst you get on with running of your business, um, so much time and energy that is saved. The laws have changed in regards to accounting. I IFRS 16 requires tenants to account for leases as a liability on their balance, balance sheet, sheet yeah. which is a whole different ball game than how it was before. So that's just a few of the reasons why people are opting for the flexible alternative. Sometimes the industry has been seen from the outside as expensive. What, what would you say to those comments? Well, when you rent space, it's really about the total occupancy costs. The amount of money that comes out of your bank account at the end of a given period. Now, if you compare the square foot price for a serviced or flex versus a traditional lease, then obviously it's going to look more expensive. But it's not an apples for apples comparison. Right. For example, um, on the flex arrangement, you are paying all inclusive of your rent, of your rates, of your service charge, of your cleaning, um, of your insurance of the building. You also need to rent a lot less square feet in a flex. Why? Because you don't need to rent space for breakout areas, for reception, meet and greet areas, all of these spaces that are available, uh, kitchen facilities, meeting rooms, event spaces, all of these spaces I just mentioned, they're available in the building, but you're not paying for them directly. Indirectly, it's all um, included in the package. But the actual amount of pounds that you spend running your office um, is nowhere near what people think it is. The total occupancy costs, there are plenty of cost calculators that will show that it is on par or more economical way of doing it. And the biggest costs that I didn't even mention were the fit out and the dilapidations and the unexpected service charge bills. You throw those into the mix, it's a whole different ballgame. So do people actually, do they, when they're looking for an office, perhaps look at the lease costs, then you show them the flex costs so they can evaluate what's best perhaps for them, for the company, for the balance sheet? Yeah, there's lots of clients nowadays that are considering both, um, and we will give them a, uh, a a cost calculator and uh, and and an estimate of expenses to to give them a bit more peace of mind because sometimes the list prices um, and when they a lot of people like breaking back things to per square foot, that because that's how they're taught to calculate. Yeah, yeah, in the property world. Yeah, but like I've just explained, it's about the total occupancy cost, um, and that's when the flex world becomes a lot more of a viable alternative. Now, Richard, across the board, is it true that perhaps different industries have different views on flexible working? Yes, most definitely. I think there's a huge difference between financial companies and tech, for example. Um, today, David Solomon of Goldman Sachs said that he found that he, he rejects the concept of working from home was the new normal. He said that it was an aberration um, and something that he would like to um, see the back of. Um, JP Morgan, working from home has a negative effect on, on productivity, um, said the chief exec, Jamie Dimond. Um, Barclays, they said that the hope that the vaccine rollout will now enable people to come back to the office. Um, tech companies like Microsoft, Facebook, Twitter, they've all said that they would be happy for a lot of their team to be working from home. Um, so it really is split across the board. And I think, I, th I think personally, they've made those announcements a bit too quick. I think they might have said them to, you know, it's all, a lot of it is about the war on talent, isn't it? It's about retaining the best talent and it's about um, attracting the best talent. And so you've got to keep your team happy. Um, and to be fair to them, a lot of the jobs that they're doing, you can work from home. I mean, in my office, for example, we used to have everybody in the office, uh, but now we have a tech team and we have marketing and we have finance, um, like accounts, uh, accountants working from home. Um, so I do understand it, but I just think that the reality is, is that if you're not in the office, you can't collaborate. But yeah, it's the human interaction and, and where we are as human and the psychology of working and the psychology of the environment and what's been sort of put out there that, yeah, we're, we're made 
to uh, to be alongside people. We'll function better as human beings. I think humans need to be with humans. Um, but like anything in life, there's probably a middle ground um, that, that we'll reach. But I've looked at it from a very interesting perspective as well because I look at the younger generation of people that are coming into work. Okay, so they're not quite in the workplace. And let's just say someone who is trained to be an, or training to be an accountant or a lawyer. They need to be amongst their peers mm. to learn how to be a lawyer. Yeah. You can't just email someone a document and say, prepare this or let's have a team meeting. It really is part of the whole, forget the social collaboration mm. and how you interact and then progress through a career. Yeah. But I think, uh, you know, that's it's it's the younger generation, perhaps also that's going to be disadvantaged by all these thoughts of or well, should we keep everybody at home or should we bring them you know back to work we have lots of uh, the team that are new to the industry to the company um and i need to be sharing my experiences i need to be mentoring them to train them to just share my experiences and just the marketplace and just give them some advice um and i can't do that remotely i mean you can do that via zoom etc but it's just not the same you really do need to be with people for at least some of the time. We spoke briefly uh, about hub and spoke, but can you give me like on a, a large scale, a, a really good example of, of where that's taking place? Um, I think that the biggest and best example of that is in the US. Um, I'm sure you've noticed, but isn't it fascinating the way you speak to so many Americans and so many of them live in a different place to where they were born? relocating yeah. within the country is very common whereas in the uk i don't think we do that very much we kind of like live where we live and yeah. that's pretty much it one of the reasons is probably because america's so vast and it's just got like it's it's 50 states like 50 countries so i can understand that but i think for so many people they're moving to areas like austin um, in Texas, da it, Austin, Dallas, Houston, in Texas, from some sometimes from areas like San Francisco, um, companies like Apple and Facebook are moving into Texas. Um, Hewlett Packard are moving to Houston from California. Um, Dallas, the five billion dollar corridor. Uh, companies like Toyota, J.P. Morgan, Boeing, they're moving into the area. And there's lifestyle cities like Boulder in Denver, um, the Panhandle of Florida, Miami, Boca Raton. Um, People moving from New York, for example. I mean, Manhattan is a shadow of its former self. Um, you know, I can't wait for it to get back to what it was. But the truth is, is that people want to be living in somewhere like, you know, people were um, commuting from like New Jersey or Connecticut. Um, those areas, like you can't get space or you can hardly find somewhere to live because the demand is so high. Um, so I think that the US is a great example where there is um, a large degree of, this, of the hub and spoke. Um, don't get me wrong, California is, you know, doesn't take long to get to the mountains or to the ocean. Um, and you can then, within a short space of time, you know, be in, in downtown LA. So, of course, they'll always retain, um, you know, that allure. The hub. Yes, exactly. Um, but... Yeah, US is, is the best example. So we've discussed in today's uh, journey of discovery about flexible office space and, and um, office freedom, um, the sort of the size of the marketplace, and you said it represents sort of 15%. But what, what's the future landscape for flexible working? Well, I think there was about a 4% increase in 2020, which obviously was a, as a direct result of COVID, but I think in 2021, the market is going to be increasing to 20, by probably about 21%. Um, in 2018, there were 16,500 locations, uh, 2021, 20,000 locations, and there's expected to be about um, 40,000 locations by 2025. Um, and by 2030, um, the marketplace is expected to be about 30% flex. So we're right out of time for another week. Richard, you must be relieved that we're done and dusted. Join us again for episode three next week. <laughs> <laughs>